If yes. you could think the one thing that the enemy would not want Christians to do, it would be to tell people about Jesus because it's the adversary will do anything he can to keep people away from the gospel, to keep people away from Jesus. And so it is spiritual warfare. So how do we fight spiritual warfare? We fight spiritual warfare with the word of God and with prayer. And so if we're highly intentional in the word of God, if we're highly intentional in prayer, uh, God doesn't say he'll answer all our prayers, but he does say in his word that he'll answer our prayers if it pleases him. And I cannot imagine that evangelism and telling people about his son Jesus does not please him. And so it's, it's, it's a promise from God, not a promised timing, but a promised answered prayer that if we ask for opportunities to share the gospel, he is going to be pleased with that. And in his time, he will open the doors to that. Uh, before the recording, you and I were talking about family, and I was telling you about my wife, Nellie Jo, who's an artist. And um, not only is she an artist, but she's an incredible communicator of the gospel. Uh, she has this sweet temperament. Uh, everybody likes her. About one third of people like me, but everybody likes Nellie Jo. And she's in her art studio and she has places where she just brings up conversations. She ran into someone that she had met casually. I happened to be there. But the day before I was praying with my wife and she verbally prayed, God, I'm just asking you, according to your time, to just bring some people in my path where I might tell them about Christ. She didn't ask for the next day, but this was the next day. This was the next day. We're walking into an office building and um, a, a young lady that she has befriended says, Nellie Joe, you won't believe this. I was just praying for you to come see me because wow. I am so hurt. I am so, I'm in so much pain right now. And I know you're a Christian. I know you know that I am not. And I just want to talk to you. Oh, and I got to watch yeah. that conversation unfold. I had a few things to offer, but I can assure you they weren't nearly as meaningful as what Nellie Jo offered Noel, that is her name. And what had just happened in our town, in the Nashville area, I live in Franklin, Tennessee, which is in the Nashville area. We'd had another one of those school shootings. And this one, this one was at a, a Presbyterian church school, not too far from where I live. Noel knew some people in the school and she could not, and she, and she knew some parents of children killed in the school. And she was trying to comprehend that in the scope of what is God doing? So it was this perfect opportunity. So the, you asked me a question at the beginning and I'm going to try to bring myself back to it. The question at the beginning is, you know, why, why not? Well, very simply is spiritual warfare. So we have to fight this with spiritual warfare. We have to ask God for opportunities. And secondly, in the context of the congregation, we have to make it a priority. That's simply said, not always simply done. I could unpack that in a lot of ways, but I'm going to call a timeout on me, right, for just a moment and, and let you go to the next topic <laughs> before I dominate your show. That's okay. Well, you know, the next question I was going to ask you is, how do you develop a culture of evangelism in a church? Well, you develop a culture of evangelism with high intentionality. Um we, I keep on saying we did research projects. It sounds like I lead the most boring life in the world when I say we did research projects, but our team did research projects on churches that were reaching people with the gospel. So one way to find out how churches become evangelistic is to go to those churches that are evangelistic and find the positive attributes. The most common attribute of these churches were that they had intentional times of prayer to do evangelism. Now, some of them may have had evangelism programs. Some of them may have had evangelism training. But the most common was that they had an intentional time of evangelism. Um, for, forgive me for just talking about one of my books, but I produced this in a book form uh, that will be released in a week or two called Pray and Go. And the whole idea of the book is to get churches to go through 30 days of praying for evangelistic opportunities. Mm -hmm. It was based upon that research. Remember, God answers prayers if it pleases him, mm -hmm. and this pleases him. And so when churches do that, we are seeing that God is honoring those prayers. Think about what churches do without hesitation. They have a preaching ministry. They have fellowship. They usually have small groups. Uh, they usually have ministry in the community of some type. That is what they think they should be doing, which is correct. But they are not intentional in the same way about evangelism. 
-hmm. Only 4% of churches are in the United States of the 350,000 churches. And that's so scary. That's, that's, that's the culture. That's the culture yeah. issue. Yeah, that, that's a scary place to be because we really need more evangelism and we need more teaching from the pastor or from the church people, the elders, or, you know, put something together. Um, so now there's, there's this whole generation of millennials and Gen Z's. How can we reach them for the gospel? Well, first of all, there's good news. Um, the only point for which we have significant data would be beginning with the builder generation, those born before 1946. And then you have the boomers born between 46 and 64. Then you have Gen X. Then you have the millennials. And then now you have Gen Z. Uh, we've seen a decline in receptivity to the gospel, according to their own statements from the builders through um, the millennials. We're seeing that turn now with Gen Z. So part of the hopeful information right now is those who are born 2000 and, and after, very young generation, 23 would be the oldest of them. Um, that generation is now more receptive to the gospel. My guess is they've tried so much and nothing has 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 truly met their innermost need, which is which is Christ. And they know that and they have all the technology and they have all the the, the toys and the tools, but it has not. And so the first thing that we're saying seeing is it is it is turning around. Secondly, what do these Gen Zers want? And it would be the same thing for millennials or Gen Xers or boomers or anybody. What 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 do they want? They want to establish a meaningful relationship with someone. And the key is meaningful. Uh, it's not, it is, it is something where they know that someone truly cares about them. The reason Noel said, I have been praying for you to come see me, Nellie Joe, and they just happened to meet in a lobby of an office, was she could tell that Nellie Joe cared about her in their previous conversations. Mm -hmm. So when she prayed, she wanted someone to come see her that she trusted, even though her worldview was so different than Nellie Joe's. Mm -hmm. So the Gen Z, and the other generations are not unlike anybody else. For the most part, they want meaningful relationships. And though there will be times that we can share the gospel spontaneously on a plane in a, in a time where we have a little time to know someone, most of the time it is going to be our intentionality being among those like Christ was among them and being intentional with our love where we now have a foundation from which they will hear the gospel. So nothing has changed, essentially. Maybe maybe technology has changed, definitely, and maybe culture has shifted, undoubtedly. But the essence of how we reach people is the same as it was 2,000 years ago as Jesus developed relationships with those that he calls sinners like me and you. Mm -hmm. And that's the key, right? Um, relationships, because um, I'm a Bible study group leader, uh, do Bible study fellowship. And I tell the ladies all the time, you know, you got to share the gospel. But I think sometimes they look at me like I have two heads, but some people just have that hard time of how do you get it started? How do we do this? What do you think about that? Well, I'm an introvert and, and I can be perfectly happy in a corner by myself most of the day. I do want to see my wife. She's gone at the beach right now, but I do want to see her. I do want love seeing my sons. I get to see them at least uh, by telephone or Zoom here or see them uh, almost every day. They stay in contact with me. I want to see my grandchildren, all 11 of them, as much as possible. But I, 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 I will say this, I have to be intentional many times to reach out to them. So these people who, who are like Tom, who are not naturally conversationalists, which I'm not, people are sometimes surprised because they'll see, hear me in this kind of setting and they'll presume, oh, you, you talk a lot and you're that. No, I'm, I'm a classic introvert. First thing I have to do is be intentional, willingness to be intentional. So I have to say, okay, God, uh, I know this is not natural for me to start up a conversation with someone. And then secondly, as I indicated with some of the other questions that you've asked thus far, mm -hmm. I have to be prayerful about it. Sharing the gospel is not something that has to be done by well-trained conversationalists or people who have a 
a lot of stuff that they have memorized. Sharing the gospel is telling your story and asking God to give you the opportunity to tell your story. I have shared Christ many times with this story. And it seems like a segue always got into, allowed me to get into that. My high school football coach shared the gospel with me. There's a lot more story to it, and I'm not going to take the time to do that. But the fact that he did, and I was able to somehow, God opened that door for that segue into the conversation, allowed me to tell my story. I, I didn't I don't go through a memorized presentation and while there's nothing wrong with that, I am more comfortable just talking about what Christ has done in my life. And so for for the ladies and for the others that you have an influence upon, uh, you know, the simple word is tell what Christ has done for you. And everything else will begin to unfold. The gospel will be clear if you're a true follower of Christ, because you have repented of sin. You have placed your faith in Christ. And there was obviously an influence of a person or event or situation or a combination of those that brought you to that point. Tell your story. Mm, one, I love that advice because I have two women that I know that want to go into the mall and start sharing the gospel there. And um, I'm definitely showing them this video because they're going to enjoy this whole conversation that we're having today. So um. Great. You know, so what what are some of the the ways to follow up with individuals who we who expressed an interest in Christianity or the gospels? I mean, once you've laid it down and you've told your story, how do you follow up? Presuming that they are local. Now that's one that would be a presumption there. Presuming it is someone that you can follow up with in person and presuming that it's appropriate to be with that person in person. I would say and I do this because Jesus did that, go and eat with them. Go and have coffee with them. Uh, do, do do what Jesus did. He dined with sinners. He he was among them. Robert Coleman wrote a masterful book. I don't know if it's a half a century old, it may be now, called The Master Plan of Evangelism. And it's a classic because his book basically said, this is what Jesus did, and we can do it as well. So once you have a meal or a coffee at a coffee shop with someone, you know, unless something really weird is going on, you know that you're going to have a deeper relationship with that person. And you're able to talk about those things that you couldn't, that maybe you did not have time or it felt a little more awkward in a, in a, in a more spontaneous setting than doing so. Um, Nellie Joe and I have made a practice of it, not always faithful. I don't want to oversell who, what we're doing, not always consistent, let me say that. But we make a practice of taking people out to, to, to lunch uh, and sometimes coffee, but usually lunch. And the second thing you can do, this may seem counterintuitive to a lot of people, invite them to your church and walk into the door in the church with them. And then after church is over, take them to a meal. Now you say, oh, these people will never go out, go to a church. They're, they're, they're not only unchurched, but they seem to have an anti-Christian cultural bias. Guess what? 83% of non-believers when invited to church and ask, and the person says, I will walk into the building with you. 93% will say yes. Now, we proved that empirically through a study by actually doing it across the nation, and it wasn't geographically biased in any way. But my point is, people are so hungry for relationships that what's keeping them from church are misperceptions and fear of the unknown. And if you walk into the church with them, the church facility, uh, that is going to, again, solidify next steps but it would now be beyond you because they're now connecting uh, with the body of Christ. I have this deep seated, hopefully biblical bias that the local church is misunderstood. Think about it, Nancy, the local church from acts two to revelation three is the, the topic from the beginning of the church in acts two, you either have a letter to a church, a letter about a church or, or something written in the context of the church. The local church is God's plan A for his mission, and he didn't give us a plan B. So once we get into that imperfect place called the local church, with all of us hypocrites who are there, they begin to connect with others who, who are very much, they, they're surprised that we're most of us are normal people. In fact, 
probably normal to a fault at times. So get them in a setting where you can have a deeper relationship. Number one, coffee, meal. Number two, invite them to church. That was God's plan anyway, from the church in Jerusalem forward. As they became believers, they formed a church and they gathered together and they devoted themselves to what the apostles teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And then in Acts 2.47, it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They connected in the church. Those on the outside looked in and said, I like what I see. And they became followers of Christ. That is what wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Okay. Thank you. I mean, Thank you. That, that just wraps everything up into um, knowing that people do want to have a connection somewhere and, you, and you're leading them that way. Um, but, you know, it makes me also think about what if somebody comes into the church and nobody pays attention to them or nobody shares Christ's love with them? How are they going to feel? What, what have you seen on the negative side happen to a person like that? I have seen a lot, unfortunately, and one of the things that we try to do in our ministry at Church Answers is to help church leaders, to help their churches, to see how important hospitality is when people come into your doors. We talk about hospitality actually at the website, and that's even before they come, because over 90% of people before they come to a church are going to go to the church's website. And they're going to they're going to see they, they want to know the time of service and they want to know the physical address for sure. But they're going to try to get a, a sense of the the people there. The do I really want to go there? So so an unchurched person is going to look at your website. So one of the first things we do is say, prepare your website as if lost people are looking because they are for the most part. Very few members go to a church website. That's a misconception. Mostly it's Christians who are looking for a church or non-Christians who are thinking about the gospel. Those are, those are the two, two, big, two big groups. So it begins at the website. But then you have to be prepared for when they come. And equipping the saints to do the work of ministry means a lot of things. When Paul was given that admonition to the church at Ephesus, and, and he talked about so many things where, where we're going to have the pastors and teachers equip them to do the work of ministry. Equipping them to do the work of ministry, hospitality is part of the work of ministry. And therefore, every single church should have a an equipped, trained hospitality ministry. Many years ago, I was a pastor. I hadn't been a pastor in a long time. My path has been businessman, pastor, dean of a seminary, president of Lifeway, and now president of uh, Church Answers. That's been my past. So it's been a long time since I've been been a pastor. But my first church had seven people in it. And the first person I had the opportunity to share the gospel with was a guy named Steve. And he asked what he could do in the church and among other things. <laughs> my dominant spiritual gift is ignorance. And I, and I exercise it quite a bit. And I, I I'm thinking, I don't know what to tell this dude. I'm a brand new pastor. And finally, I just said, Steve, stand out in the parking lot and welcome people. It was amazing how this new Christian greeting people had an impact upon our church. He he was pretty equipped with his personality, but I tried to give him some tips. Every church needs to have that hospitality, that welcome ministry. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a book called Becoming a Welcoming Church. And the whole thesis behind that is if you want to have any type of sticky factor, you need to equip people to do evangelism. You need to equip people to understand the word of God. You need to equip people to do service and ministry in the community. Definitely. But you need to equip people to be hospitable, especially when they're coming into the church. That should be part of the church's life and ministry. Yeah, that's like the beginning of uh, making somebody feel very comfortable for being there. And that's that's such a great thing. Like, oh, somebody cares about me. They really actually are, are greeting me. They're saying hello. They're they're welcoming me into a church. That's so important. Um, the so number one sticky, I'm sorry, excuse me, but the number one sticky factor for a first time guest is that someone sits with him or her or them. Yeah. That's it. When they sit by themselves, they feel very much alone. But if someone intentionally says, may I sit with you, it makes all the difference in the world. That has, happened. Me, that has happened to me in one church and I've been to many. <laughs> so there I, you go. You. 
Thank you for saying that because that was very well needed. Well, um, your ministry is churchanswers.com where you can get free resources for churches with podcasts and and your book called Sharing the Gospel, which is related to here. And, um, you know, uh, Sharing the Gospel with Ease, it's called. And uh, Pray and Go is your newest book. I love that Pray and Go um, what is that about? Like, I know you were talking and reflecting on that a little bit before, but I mean, are you talking about, you know, pray and then go share the gospel? Is that what the basic premise of that is? It's a 30 day challenge to change a culture of a church and to change the culture of a Christian. That's just as simple as that. Uh, we're asking those who go through this 30 day challenge to spend an average of 20 minutes a day. Sometimes it'll be five to 10 minutes a day. Sometimes it could be as long as an hour, but an average of 20 minutes a day for 30 days. And those who are going through it do so simultaneously and are accountable to one another for those 30 days. And each day you are doing something to have an outward focus. It may be a prayer that you're praying. It may be studying a scripture that reminds you of our responsibility to look beyond ourselves. It may be writing a letter or an email to someone in the community encouraging them. Four or five times is actually getting up and going. And the going is very non-threatening. Uh, if you're in a neighborhood, for example, a, a neighborhood that has a street and sidewalks, we encourage people to go into that neighborhood, walk by each house slowly and pray for those in the home. Pray for them to know Christ. Pray for them to, for their families. Pray for them. Some churches, and it depends on the context, some churches will leave a door hanger and say, we prayed for you, just as just as a reminder. But the whole idea of going is very non-threatening. Uh, usually we ask you to go for about 30 to 40 minutes. And then after you've prayed in your neighborhood, if it's not conducive to, to walking in a car and just driving by to areas. And it is amazing that God answers those prayers and you will you you will see over time what God is doing more than what we are doing. So pray and go is a simple 30 day challenge to look beyond yourself, to look beyond the walls of your church and to look beyond our own typical patterns of life to see the world that Christ is doing. I love I, I love the fact that the servant's eyes were open to the chariots of fire. And so he was no longer afraid of the enemy and the attacking forces. Sometimes we need our eyes open to what God is doing in order to be confident that it is not by our strength nor by our power, but by the spirit of the Lord God Almighty. How encouraging is that? Thank you so much for saying that. It was wonderful. And and Thank so you. as we end this, what would you like to leave my audience with today? With a admonition to be bold, to be courageous. To, to be that type of person that is confident that God is going to do a work in you and it is not of your own strength, of your own power. Um, I, anytime I've tried in Tom's power, I have failed. Anytime I have tried in God's power, he has succeeded. So don't think that sharing the gospel is something that you have to be able to do with this outgoing personality, outflowing personality. I don't have it. And don't think that uh, uh, you have to have all the scholarly knowledge of uh, the 66 books of the Bible. I like that, but you don't have to know that God is going to use you because he says he will answer our prayers if it pleases him. And we know Acts 1-8, what Jesus said right before he ascended was you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that was the last words he said on earth. They must be important. So we need to obey them. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. I have three questions for you to think about. How can you show your passion for Jesus and share the good news? How can you start evangelism within your church community to share their faith in everyday life? And what are some of the obstacles to evangelism and how can you overcome them? Well, the truth is found in Jesus. Just pray. And do you listen to the call of God? Because God speaks to you every day. Are you listening to the call? <music>